your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people just like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest I actually met when I was a presenter with the Orange County Veg Fest at the time she was volunteering as the demo coordinator, and I also saw her do a demo, and I have two of her books. She's written 10 books. I mean, it took me my, like, my whole life to write two, 10 books, including Vegan Comfort Foods and Going Vegan. She has eight other books, which I'm sure she'll tell you about. She's going to be a doing a demo today of a delicious recipe and she also is the food editor for a wonderful magazine called veg news and she has another fun job she's going to tell us about it's great to connect with her again please welcome to the show Joni Newman thank you so much for being here hello thanks for having me I'm super excited to share this recipe with you today like you said I'm Joni hi um I love to cook and I love food so my uh, excitement about sharing plant-based recipes with folks has always been um, the majority of what drives me. Uh, I was talking earlier with you. I hate promoting myself, but I love promoting good food, um, which is why one of the main things that I do now is I work at Tanaka Farms where I teach kids, adults, everybody about where their food comes from. And it's awesome because Year round, I'm surrounded by amazing seasonal, fresh, responsibly farmed vegetables. So I always get to uh, have what's in season and I always get to try out new things and share that with the world. And that really is where my uh, passion lies, is sharing good food with the world and proving <laughs> that you don't need animal products to have tasty food. You know, I, I proved that like 50 years ago. What's what's with people? But how long, how long have you been vegan and how did you t- come to veganism? Uh, 15 years this July. It was my 15 year big anniversary. Um, I will admit that I was a kind of a half ass vegetarian on and off since high school. Um, and in July of 05, 4th of July to be exact, I decided to start a master cleanse because I said, if I can do nothing but lemonade on 4th of July when everybody's eating hot dogs and drinking beer, then I can do anything. So I did that. I did that for 11 days. And then I went raw vegan for about six months. I felt great, but I really missed cooking. So then I based cooking back in and I've been vegan ever since. Well, congratulations on your vegan anniversary. Mine is September 1st. It'll be 43 years. 43 years. That's incredible. I know. I meet people and they go, you've been vegan longer than I've been alive. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, not what, me. I what still you- got one year. What are you going to make? One year old. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. What are you going to make for us today, Joni? Today we're going to make, it's like a tuna salad, but it has no tuna. Um, It's made using one of my favorite ingredients we're going to talk about a little bit today, which is haijiki seaweed. And um, to get started, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on some water to boil. Yeah, through the magic of television, so it might already have been boiled. But um, this is haijiki seaweed. Hajiki seaweed is a very, very strong seafood flavor. It has, um, when you reconstitute it, you only need a little bit, and you reconstitute it, it gets bigger. And so you can use it uh, in all kinds of things. You can use the, the broth that you make when you reconstitute it in soups to give it like a seafoody flavor. If you're missing that clam chowder of your days past, just blend that up with some potatoes and you can make a nice uh, clam chowder base. Um, but I love high GBC. You can get it in, um, you can get it at like Whole Foods and places like that or online, but I find it's less expensive if you go to an Asian market and you can find that. And it's got lots of different names, but um, Hijiki is the most common name. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get that constituting in some hot water, as you can see here, so that we can use that to make our salad. That just has to sit for about 10 minutes. Then we'll get started on uh, making the dressing. I'm going to make a double batch of dressing today because I want to use it for some other items when we serve at the end. So I'm going to show you um, that. So we'll start with the dressing. It's going to use my favorite kitchen tool, which is my immersion blender, my stick blender. I know a million people have those expensive Vitamixes. And honestly, I don't have the kitchen space for it. My pup decided to join us. Um, I don't have the space in my kitchen for it. I live in a a fairly small house. But also, I don't have the money for a $400 blender. I wish I, I could, but at this time, this little $30 gadget travels well and has been treating me well for a long time. 
So we're gonna start with that. Plus I love the way that it emulsifies and makes things really, really smooth. So we're gonna start by making the dressing and we're gonna start with adding in, you guys have probably heard of this because it's like all the rage right now, aquafaba, right? The liquid from your can of chickpeas. So we're gonna start by draining the chickpeas and we're gonna add in a half a cup, I'm gonna double it up. So I'm gonna just strain the liquid into a measuring cup here. Hey, Joni, can I ask you a couple questions? Sure. Uh, Diane wants to know if the hijiki has a salty taste and VG and many others are complimenting your spice rack and wanting to know where you got it. That spice rack is actually four spice racks. I got it at Cost Plus World Market probably 20 years ago. They might still have it, but it, I love it too. And I bought all the spice jars independently and I have like a thousand of them. They just happen to fit in that one, but thank you. Um, hijiki, does it have a salty flavor? Not really more seafoody, so I guess you would associate that with salt. Yes, sure. It gives you the, the feeling of that. Um, so I'm going to add this to my immersion blender cup, but you could use a regular bowl too. So I'm going to use about a cup because uh, I'm doubling the recipe. So we're going to use about a cup. And we're just going to add all the other ingredients for the dressing. We're going to add in cashews. And these are soaked um, overnight, and then I drained and rinsed them. The recipe calls for a half a cup, and since I'm doubling it, we're going to do a whole cup. I love snacking on on uh, the soaked cashews because they're so uh, soft, velvety, once they're all, like, puffed up like that. So I'm going to sneak one right now. Okay, so we've got that in there. Then we're going to add in some nutritional yeast, my other favorite vegan ingredient. And we're gonna add in, that was two tablespoons, I'm doubling it up, so that was a quarter cup. Look at we're boiling already, that's exciting. That was fast. So we have the nutritional yeast, then we're gonna add in some whole grain mustard. You can use Dijon, you can use whatever you have. But I like the whole grain mustard because I like that pungent taste that you get from the mustard seed. Then we're gonna add in that out of the way. We're going to add in some lemon juice. I like to roll my lemons to get as much juice out of them as I can. The recipe calls for one tablespoon. And I can usually get, depending on how juicy that lemon is, I can usually get a tablespoon out of a half of a lemon. So I'm going to use a whole lemon because I'm doing a double. And you can use bottled lemon juice if you want. There's only two of us in our household. So a lot of times I'll use bottled stuff and canned stuff because the fresh stuff will go bad because I don't use it fast enough. So unless I want to go to the store every day, like I said, luckily I work on a farm so I can bring fresh stuff home pretty often. All right, we're going to add in some chia seeds, you can use black or white, whatever. Just gonna help thicken up the sauce. Then we're gonna add in some garlic powder, half teaspoon, some onion powder, half teaspoon. We're gonna throw in um, some black pepper, about a quarter teaspoon. And then up to you, I know some of you use salt and some of you don't. You want to add a little salt, you can add a little salt to there to taste. And this is another really fun ingredient. And this is an optional ingredient. You don't have to add it, but it's this this dressing that we're making is kind of substitution for mayonnaise. Since with uh, tuna salad, you usually mix it with mayonnaise and a lot of other stuff. There's this ingredient called a, it's a Himalayan black salt. This is a big bottle of big coarse crystals. I use my coffee grinder. I have one coffee grinder that I have dedicated just for spice grinding because it can grind things into a very, very fine powder. And I ground it up into this very, very fine powder. Now this stuff smells horrible. It, it, it smells like sulfur. It's the worst smelling stuff ever, but it adds that sulfury, eggy flavor to different things. So it's a great addition to tofu scrambled, but it's a finishing salt. So it loses its flavor if you get it hot. So you only want to add it at the end of your cooking and you only want to add it to cold dishes. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna add a little bit of that to give it that sulfury kind of flavor. And I'm gonna add in a little paprika. And then we're gonna blend this up. Get it all blended up to a nice puree. Now that bean juice that we put in there, that's like an emulsifier. It kind of acts like egg whites when you use it to make things. We're gonna get that nice and blended up, nice and smooth. Now this is a recipe you can make this part ahead of time so that if you leave it sitting in the fridge overnight, those chia seeds will really, really, really thicken it up. All right, that's it for the dressing, pretty easy. So Joni, Caroline wants to know if you could use kelp granules instead of the hijiki. You could, it's just not gonna have as strong of a, of a seafood flavor. I love all the different seaweeds. I use dulce, I use kelp, I use all kinds of different seaweeds in all kinds of different cooking applications. I use nori for a lot of things. But what I find is that the hijiki has a very, very strong seafoody flavor. And the actual pieces of seaweed stick, they stay together, they stay in one piece. They don't um, dissolve. So that's the reason I like it for this salad. It's actually very pretty when you use it in salads too. Set that aside. All right, so the dressing's all done. Now we're gonna make the salad, okay? Also, kitchen tip, squeezy bottles. You make a lot of your own dressings and your own salad dressings and sauces, you have a squeezy bottle on hand. You can get them really inexpensively. I think Smart and Final has like a six pack for less than $10. You can um, put a little label on it, stick it in the fridge and always have the good stuff. Plus we eat with our eyes first, right? So if you have squeezy bottles, then you can do fancy drizzles and people think you're amazing. So we're gonna put some of that in here because remember I made a double batch. And we'll use that later. You can kind of see what it looks like in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now I have a nice squeezy bottle with some in it. And let's get to making the actual salad. So we get a bigger bowl here. So guys, she's not making faux salmon. She's making faux tuna. And the recipe is already in the show notes. So if you can't see it now, you'll see it right afterwards, I'm sure. All right. So this is probably going to be hard for you to see because this bowl you can't see through. So... I'm gonna throw all those chickpeas from that drained can right in there. And then I'm just gonna kind of smash it up with a fork. Forgot my fork. So smash it up as much as you like. I like um, to leave some chunks in there to give it a little bit of texture, but you're just gonna smash it up with a fork. You can use a potato masher or a fork or back of a spoon. And the fun thing about this recipe too is I don't know, growing up, I liked my tuna salad really plain. Like I didn't put anything in it, just tuna and mayonnaise. Um, and then as I grew up, started adding pickle relish and onions, and celery and all that fun stuff. So you can kind of add whatever you want to it. You know what's funny is I forgot to put the um, pickle relish and the, the dill in the dressing, but that's okay, we'll throw it right in the salad. Because that was the last part of the dressing, but you're supposed to stir it in after you blend it. So we'll add it right here to the salad, too. So you can add all kinds of fun things. Um, today, I'm going to add some chopped radishes. We're going to add some um, celery, some onions, some pickle relish. Um, I have some pepperoncinis that I brought along just for fun, some banana peppers. All right. So those are all nice and smashed. You can kind of see the texture that I got it there, all smashed up. Kind of gives it that flakiness like they do like you have in a tuna salad. All right. So we've got that. Next up, we're going to add, let me just add that pickle relish in now before I forget. I use dill pickle relish, but if you use sweet pickle relish, you do you. I'm not going to judge you, I promise. <laughs> um, and also some dill. So I got some fresh dill. Yum, yum, yum. You can use dried dill or... Fresh dill. Remember, it's a three to one ratio of dried to fresh when it comes to dill. 
and most herbs. Uh, if you're using fresh, it's gonna be a tablespoon. If you're using dry, it's going to be a teaspoon. I love dill. It makes everything taste fresh and herbaceous. Yum, yum. All right. I'm just gonna throw that in there. Then we're gonna add in that hijiki. So I'm gonna strain it out from the liquid. And you, like I said earlier, you can save that liquid. So this is just one tablespoon that turned into all of this. One tablespoon of dried turned into about a quarter cup. Uh, you can't really, see. there, about a quarter cup of hydrated. And then this liquid that's left over is great as like added to soups or as a broth to flavor other things. Marinate tofu in so you can have like a tofu, tofish. Uh, drop that in there. You can see it really holds together nicely. It's got these nice long strands. So it'll stay together really well. You will get a similar flavor if you use those other kinds of seaweeds, the other granules, even nori, but nori will get very slimy. So um, it's up to you. All right, next up, let's add in some celery. So we're gonna chop up some celery. Come off the edges there. And your call, if you wanna do little tiny slices, little tiny uh, dices, whatever your palate loves. I like a little crunch in there, so I'll leave them a little bit big. Like that. And then we're gonna add in also some chopped up radishes, which are my absolute least favorite vegetable to chop. Do you have a favorite vegetable to chop? Well, well you know what? I use I use this really cool mandolin from Tupperware. So like with the radish, you just you drop it in the little thing and you go like this. Cause I I got a thing. I got I can't use my right arm so much, so I use these oh, tools. That's right. and, and so it's really cool. Like you, you dump the radish in or the whatever, and it's it's really cool. So, but uh, I, you know, it's hard to cut in things like big things that, that are that are round, like jicama, things like that. Those are hard. Jicama is a tough one, that's for sure. Okay. I have some power tools. I just never get them out because I don't like to clean them afterwards. And I just find that there's just something therapeutic about hand chopping. But I, I know do it, remember working with you and you do use all the fun tools. You have yeah, all it, of it, the I think it's because I spent so many years as a volunteer culinary instructor at the Braille Institute, and I found that the tools for, for the people that didn't have sight, it was just easier for them. And then I got in the habit of using them myself. That makes perfect sense. That makes totally perfect sense. Yeah. All yeah, right. So, so some, uh, jo Joni, I don't Go know if you, get, if you know the answer to this. I think you live close to the beach, but somebody's saying, can you just eat the seaweed that you see on the beach? Is that edible? That's kelp usually. Um, in Laguna Beach, which is in Orange County, they have a kelp festival every year. And yes, you can. Um, there's kelp gardens, there's kelp farms. So you can, I would clean it and I would make sure you check it, check the water quality of where you're getting your seaweed from. But yeah, that's kelp, totally. That is, that is that's interesting. I this The farm that you work at, is it, is, so it's, it's, it's open to the public right now? It is um, on a limited basis. So generally that farm, Tanaka Farms is open to the public for tours every day. Um, with the pandemic this year, sorry, my computer disappeared on me. Um, with the pandemic this year, we've had to reduce our capacity down. So instead of just being a free for all, anybody can come, you have to make reservations um, to take tours. But we do you pick tours every day, it is open to the public. Um, and we do socially distance wagon rides, um, everybody wears a mask. And we only take 16 people every half hour, but we go out around the farm, we pick vegetables, we plant our own little mini garden to take home and grow our own food, learn about responsible farming techniques. It's really awesome. And then we also have a drive through produce stand. So we converted everything to drive through to make it really safe for everybody in the community. So it's pretty awesome. Come out and visit. It sounds amazing. And it's, it's where is it located exactly? It's in Irvine, Irvine, California. Right off of uh, Jeffrey, right um, close to Cal State uh, UCI. And is it is it far from where you live in Long Beach? Yeah, it's about forty five minutes for me to get there every day, but it's worth it to have an outside office to make that little commute. 
then I can listen to podcasts and learn about all kinds of fun stuff on my way. Nice. So you, how did you write 10 books? Cause most of your books have like 200 recipes, which means they have like 2000 recipes and I have it's like wild, 200. Right? I just can't recipes. Yeah. The very first book I wrote, uh, well, the very first published book that I wrote, it's called 500 vegan recipes. So that was right out the bat. We had, I worked with a, a co-writer on that one. Her name is Celine Steen. Um, she's an amazing cook and an amazing baker and amazing food photographer. She did half and I did the other half. So that did help a bit. Um, and then as soon as we finished that, we we're like, whoo, I'm never doing this again. And then before that one even came out, uh, our publisher had asked us to write the next one, which was a book called uh, The Complete Guide to Vegan Food Substitutions, which is more of a, a guidebook on how to turn anything into a vegan dish versus a complete recipe book. But it does have a whole bunch of recipes in it as well. Um, every time we finish a cookbook, we go, oh, I'm, I, I'm done. There's no way I could do it again. But then a new ingredient hits the spotlight or a new technique comes out or a new um, trend happens. And then your, you know, your person out, your imagination gets sparked again and you get excited about trying new things again. So you just go for it. And then you, you, you surprise yourself every time. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I wrote 200 more recipes. <laughs> that is amazing. And what, what's your, what is your most recent book? The most recent one that just came out was a reboot, actually. It's the, the Best Veggie Burgers on the Planet. And that one, um, it was over 10 years old. So we figured with all the popularity of all these new meat -based bur uh, plant based burgers that um, it would be a good time to reintroduce uh, it. Because as much as people like these big meats, a lot of people miss true veggie burgers, you know, like ones that are mushy and full of veggies and oats and spinach and beans and all that stuff so we decided to give it a reboot so people could make their own at home so that's the most recent one so we're gonna add about a quarter cup of onions into here i chopped away too many but that's okay we'll use them later put them over here out of the way so when it the book that you showed earlier going vegan I think that one's probably the most appropriate one for your audience because that's the one that I wrote um, with a nutritionist. And we wrote a lot of recipes that are no oil. Um, Let me show this. It, uh, that name sounds familiar. Did she used to work at Whole Foods? She did. She was the healthy eating specialist at Whole Foods, uh, Jerry Adam. So we wrote that one together. And so I really... It's really a guidebook on how to go vegan and how to do it right and how to do it healthfully, especially if you're doing it for your health. You know, um, I always say I'm vegan for the animals. Um, you don't get these curves doing it any other way. Um, but I also know how important it is for people's health to eat a whole foods plant-based diet if they're trying to lose weight, if they're trying to, you know, battle heart disease or diabetes or um, even arthritis. Um, I was just recently diagnosed with... Um, with degenerative arthritis that's hereditary from my family and eating a whole foods plant-based diet reduces inflammation and makes the pain a lot more tolerable. So I can tell when I eat a more whole foods plant-based diet that I feel better. I feel uh, lighter on my feet. I feel less um, inflamed um, than I do when I'm eating high fat foods. So it's definitely, and a lot of junk food, like if you're eating a lot of uh, processed foods, it can definitely be inflammatory. So there's a lot of talk about that in the Going Vegan book. Talks about, um, you know, um, inflammation in the diet, yeah. acidity in the diet, things like that. Well, I'm seeing a lot of, of oil-free recipes in the book. I just took one that looked really, really delicious. It's called Grilled Citrus Cauliflower Steaks. Yeah, good stuff. I have a beautiful head of cauliflower here. I was going to chop up and add to a salad later. Um, but cauliflower steaks are super easy and fun in the summertime because we're grilling, right? We're outside. We're cooking on the grill. Um, you can just marinate, marinate a, uh, a cauliflower um, lightly. I like to lightly steam it now or let, drop it in a, um, a big pot of boiling water just to soften it just a little bit to give it a little bit more flexibility because cauliflower does tend to be a little rigid. And then um, brush it with my favorite sauce, a sweet sour sauce, teriyaki, whatever, barbecue even. Throw it on the grill. Let it get nice grill marks, flip it, and then serve that as your main course. It's so easy and it's so good for you. And so, I don't know, vegan, right? <laughs> when you call cauliflower a steak, that's like the ultimate vegan. <laughs> 
How, how did you get involved with Veg News, the wonderful magazine that you're now food editor of? I am so blessed. So uh, many years ago, um, I was asked to do a feature piece and write um, some recipes for uh, a brunch feature. And then I just stayed in contact with the food editor there over the years. I've written several recipes for the magazine and for the website. And um, she moved on, you know, she was, get, she was getting ready to retire from that position. So she told Colleen, you should call Joni because I think she would be a good person to replace me. So I got that phone call and I didn't even have to think twice before I was like, yes, of course I want to do it. <laughs> so it's been really cool because like I said earlier, I'm not actually really good at self-promotion, but I'm really good at promoting other people and the vegan lifestyle. So I feel like I get to step out of the spotlight and bring new chefs and other known chefs into the spotlight and promote them through the magazine. Um, so my job is really doing... Um, curating the print edition, all the recipes, all the recipe columns and the food features in the actual magazine, not on the website. Um, so it's really fun to reach out. Like we just had our uh, summer one come out and it's a bunch of stuff from Miami and it's so exciting. Um, and then our, I can't wait for our holiday issue to come out. You guys are going to just lose your minds with the amazing recipes that are in there. So definitely check out Veg News. On the website too, we've been releasing so many recipes daily because of the pandemic and everybody's stuck at home. So there's a lot of um, really cool recipes up on the Veg News website too. So check it out. Well, since you're the one reaching out, I have an idea. What about just one month doing like an SOS free feature and I can give you the, me and the three other ones that do this and you could have a nice yeah, little feature. Sure. Let's talk about it for sure. Yeah. I almost forgot. We're going to add some sunflower seeds into this mix. So we're going to add some, about a quarter cup of sunflower seeds. These are unsalted roasted sunflower seeds. You can use raw ones as well. Um, all the bulk bins are closed at the grocery store right now, so it's harder to find raw nuts and seeds than it has been in the past. Um, so I, I went with the roasted, but that's okay. That'll work. Uh, we're going to add that in there. I added the onions. What did I miss? Am I missing anything here? Sorry have so much fun talking. Celery, onions, sunflower seeds. Oh, radishes. We were talking about how much I hated cutting them. I was just trying to uh, avoid it to the last minute. Let's get some radishes in here. I'm just gonna dice them. Or actually I'm gonna do a half, little half moon, however you wanna do it. These are tiny ones, so sometimes they're bigger and they're easier to cut up. These little guys. You just want about a quarter cup of diced radishes to throw in. I love the crunch and the little bit of bite that they give. Super yummy. So I'm just going to cut them like that. While I'm cutting these, I can tell you right now at the farm, we've been picking radishes. And it's the cutest thing to watch like a four-year-old pick a radish out of the ground. And get so excited like they just found an Easter egg because the little pink top sticking out of the ground. It is one of my most favorite joys is watching children pick vegetables that they would have never eaten in their entire lives if they didn't pick them. Because parents tell us all the time, we bring kids to the farm and they actually eat vegetables because they picked them. Which is such an amazing lesson for parents out there. To have a little garden, even if it's just an herb garden or a, a raised bed or a, just a little pot that grows one thing or tomatoes or anything, because kids will eat it if they can grow it and plant and pick it themselves. Um, I was not a real picky eater when I was little, but my sister was, and it wasn't until she was an adult that she would eat vegetables at all, other than like green beans. Do you have any good tips for getting kids to eat those veggies? I uh, don't give them anything else. <laughs> there you go, right? <laughs> I'm not a parent, but I, you know, I think that if yeah. you don't have a lot of junk around, they'll eat. But you got to start them early. And also the parents have to eat them because if the parent, you know, kids really don't do what you say, they do what you do. So if you're modeling them and, you know, and making them delicious too, you don't have to just give them steamed kale. You can find really <laughs> delicious ways and also cutting them small. Kids don't like big pieces of anything. Fair enough. That's a good tip. Cutting them small is a good tip. That's how I get even myself to eat more vegetables. Like I'll make a chopped salad instead of big chunky vegetables. If I chop it all real small, almost like eating a bowl of salsa, but it's uh, so much easier to get so many more vegetables than when you chop them small. Okay, 
The horrible radishes are all chopped up. Yeah. Have you tried the, all the, the different color radishes? Trader Joe's sells a bag of organic radishes. They're pink so and purple. They're so good. Have you ever had a watermelon radish? Yeah, they're, they're so beautiful. Pretty. They look like a watermelon. I love Yeah, they're so pretty. And all you right, know what? So got all our beauties in here. Now we're going to add in that dressing. Stir it all up. Then I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different ways to serve it. I use my hands. Sorry about it. I like to get messy. And that's how we know it's all mixed up and good together, too. This is a pretty salad too, because you see those little bits of pink, those nice black stripes from the from the seaweed, all the colorful vegetables in there. I'm gonna bring this close to the camera so you can see what it looks like. Jennifer wants to know if there's any good restaurants in Long Beach and do you have a favorite one? Oh, and you have to talk when you show that. Yes, I'm gonna show it again. There are lots of vegan restaurants in Long Beach. One of my favorite places to go isn't actually 100% vegan, but it has a 100% vegan menu. So there's two menus. There's the regular menu and the vegan menu. And it's called Sura, and it's a Korean barbecue place. And they have an amazing, amazing uh, Korean barbecue vegan menu. It's really good. They have some really good soups and ramens and all kinds of fun stuff. So that's probably my favorite place to go in Long Beach. But Long Beach is coming up. We've got lots of vegan places now. We've got our own seabirds over here now. We've got a veggie grill, but then we've got some of the smaller places too, like the Hip Pea, uh, which is a, um, a falafel place in the most tiny space known to man. It's like, it's, it's literally like eight by eight. It's like the tiniest little restaurant. Um, it used to be a used to be a snack bar for a movie theater and turned it into a falafel spot. Um, gosh, what else do we have? We have Ahimsa, which is a great place, um, especially if you follow the type of diet where you can't have garlic and onion because they don't use any garlic and onion there. Um, and it's a really cool uh, place to hang out. Not right now, obviously, because you can't eat inside. But there's a ton of spots in um, a ton of spots in in Long Beach now. We're coming up finally. Got a lot of good stuff. All right. Let me rinse that real quick. That's the problem with using your hands. You okay. So okay. while you're rinsing, I just want to acknowledge Gaya McDermott. Thank you for your super chat donation. I want to not acknowledge someone for theirs because they told me not to, but thank you so much. Or you told me not to ring the bell. And thank you to Janelle Anderson for this beautiful card and the generous wonderful gift inside and I know what I'm going to use it for. I'd love to have your email to thank you personally. So onwards and upwards, Joni. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to show you like five different ways to serve this. Um, I know a lot of you guys are gluten free, so you don't eat bread. So I'll get this one out of the way first. It's just basically, let's make a tuna sandwich, right? Let's put some greens down on some toasted whole wheat. This is Dave's killer bread. A couple of slices of onion here. If you're worried it's gonna to be too dry, you can add some of that extra sauce that we made, right? The extra dressing. Spread it out a little bit. Now here's where I get a little goofy. I'm totally about appearances. So one of my favorite things to do, and also this is an ice cream scoop. It's a half cup ice cream scoop. And this recipe measures 147 calories for a half cup serving. So we've got a nice half cup there. I love making these little uh, balls with the ice cream scoop because it just looks so pretty. So there, we're just gonna make ourselves a little sandwich. All done. Yummy, tuna sandwich. So that is the first way you can serve it and kind of the most obvious, right? Tuna, tuna sandwich. Now, I found these recently when I was on a trip to Arizona. Have you ever seen these before? They're called moon cakes. I haven't. They're, what, they're adorable. What are they? Yeah, they're adorable. They're, I want to say it's kind of like a rice cake, but not. Um, this one is made out of rice and corn and wheat. It's each one is 16 calories. So it's a very light and crispy. And then also these are, um, wasa breads. Have you ever heard of those? They're, um, 
I don't know, they kind of taste like cardboard, but they're excellent uh, transportation devices for things like hummus or or other types of um, dips and chips. So I like <laughs> to use it instead of crackers. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm gonna throw on these ones, I'm just gonna throw a little lettuce down. Then I'm gonna add in my tuna. Then I'm gonna dress it up a little bit by adding some, since we already chopped them up, some onions there. Then we can add in, for fun, a little fresh chopped cilantro. Are you a cilantro lover or a cilantro hater? I, I, I like it. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I like it. I, I, I think it's delicious. I don't seek it all the time. My favorite herb is probably mint, but I like it very much. Bought some today, as a matter of fact. Awesome. I feel bad for those that one out of 10 people that have that uh, gene that makes cilantro taste like soap. How sad for them. I think my husband's one of them. He hates it. He calls it the devil's weed. Right. The, the, the little crunchy tortilla you saw, say the name again and where you got it. People it was a moon, it's called a moon cake. I got it at Whole Foods um, in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, but I'm sure they can be found other places. Um, yeah, it's called a moon cake. I thought that was kind of cool. And let's see, what else can we add on here? I'm gonna add some of these beautiful banana peppers. And there we have it. Like a little salad on an edible bowl. So there's that way to serve it. Now, That's if we're beautiful. Doing something a little bit more substantial, let's do a baked potato. And we can add that in there to your baked potato. Now here, I would um, heat it up afterwards. Like if you have a toaster oven, throw it in the toaster oven so that you can get it nice and um, broiled or crispy on top. And it's gonna taste amazing. Kind of like a, almost like a seafood etouffee um, added into a, uh, I'm gonna add some of those onions on top of this one too. And maybe because it's a, uh, Potato, we like to have chopped green onions on our potatoes, right? I like anything on a potato. That's true. I've been asked what my favorite um, ingredient is, or if I could only have one ingredient for the rest of my life, and it would probably be a potato, because you could do so many different things with it. So let's add some little green onions on top there. And because we have some, let's add in also, a little drizzle of that sauce. And then you fill in it. It's like a little bit more substantial, you know? You got a little bit more action going on when you have a potato as a base. It's going to taste really good in there, too. There you go. A nice baked potato. Oh, my God. It's like a restaurant there. Right? <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with all this. I'm going to have to go knock on all the neighbor's doors and ask them if they want it. Now it is Tuesday, right? Today's Tuesday. Yep. Can you spell? Can you, can you either spell mooncake or show the bag? Linda's asking because I googled it and I didn't come up with anything. Let me find the bag. Okay, it is. Oh, sorry, moon pop cake. Thank you. That's a different. Okay, I'll Google it now. Thank you. Moon pop cake. Sorry. I remember at the Whole Foods, I don't know if they still have it in Venice Beach. They used to have a machine that made them in the store. So you can watch them getting made. It's pretty cool. Okay. Well, they have a Facebook page and they're on Amazon. So I'll find them. All right. So we're going to make some tacos. I got some toasted corn tortillas. You guys ever make your own tortillas? I like making them, but it takes a long time. So most often I buy them, but it's so fun to make your own tortillas. I have a friend at work, his name's Rocky. His wife, Elena, taught me um, like the authentic way to make tortillas. So it, it looks easy when she does it. It took me like forever to get one tortilla made. And then once I finally got the feel for it, I was like, okay, I got this. It was really awesome for her to spend some time to teach me how to do it. All right, so here, 
We'll add some into our tacos. What's great about this is they're cold, you know, so you don't have to worry about keeping everything warm and it's been so hot outside. It's been muggy and the air's been full of smoke because of all the wildfires. So it's nice to be able to eat room temperature food. Of course, we should add some avocado to this one, I think. This is a taco. Oh, I got lucky on that one. So that's, that's a perfect avocado. That's like the perfect avocado. That's beautiful. We'll just add a few slices in there. Wow. So I, I'm looking at the uh, the ingredients for the, I got to put my glasses on for the moon pop cakes and I'm trying to find where to buy them. It says it's wheat flour, rice flour, corn flour, water, stevia, natural sweetener, sea salt contains gluten, 16 calories each. And apparently they come in cinnamon as well. They, I believe if I'm not mistaken, don't they have some whole grain ones too? Let me see. Oh. I feel uh, like there were like a bajillion different different ones. I've never it. seen them. You know what I do a lot of is the jicama tortillas. Oh yeah. Yeah. Or uh, what's that? What's that um, root? It's a root that uh, cassava. Have you ever had cassava bread? No, that sounds great. I don't even know if I've ever had cassava. Yeah. Cassava root. It, and it's just basically, I think they just like blend it into a, like a pulp and then spread it out and dehydrate it and it becomes crispy. And it, it's light as air, but it is super um, neutral flavor and a great transportation device for things, for sure. It gives a nice crunch. I do it all the time. I feel like I'm rushing, but I don't need to be rushing. I say this every day that I learn something new every day. And really, that's been happening on the show. I never heard of Moon Pop Cakes. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. I didn't think I'd ever be able to teach you something, darling. Yeah, absolutely. So here we got some tacos. Cilantro, of course, on our tacos. Now, do you do you cook every day for yourself and your husband? Um, I would like to say yes, but no. <laughs> um, it's tough when you have number one, two very different work schedules. Um, I get home a lot later than he does. He works very early in the morning, and he just so his eating schedule is a little bit different than mine. Um, and also our taste buds are a lot different. He's got a very yummy taste buds. He likes things that are yummy. Um, I don't know how else to say that other than kind of like a 12 year old. Um, he don't eat onions or peppers or mushrooms. So a lot of times we'll cook together, but we'll cook separately. And then there's a handful of meals that we both love that we both eat together for sure. Um, a lot of times it's cooking a big meal and then having enough for leftovers to take to lunch and stuff like that. So we don't always um, make something every day. We'll just reheat or repurpose. Um, like last night I had some, I had made some uh, macaroni and cheese and I didn't want it anymore, but I still had half of it. So I made it into like a, a beefy thing. And now it's four more meals for the next couple of, uh, next couple of days. All right. So here's some tacos. Those look pretty good, right? They look amazing, actually. <laughs> and Do then, you... of course, we have to make a salad for a nice bed of greens. Oh, just saw a tattoo. We always got to ask, what is it and what does it mean? This is the, you know, the Russian nesting doll. Um, the, I have a few tattoos. They don't all mean something. But this particular one is, I'm the biggest sister of four sisters. So my baby sister, the one that's the littlest, she has the littlest one that fits inside and we got them together on the same day. And then our other two sisters are supposed to get the medium sized ones that fit in between, but they have failed to uh, hold up to their end of the bargain quite yet. But we'll get them eventually. That's so funny. That's do, that you, one. <laughs> do, you, do you use any of my favorite kitchen items like an Instant Pot or an air fryer? I have an air fryer and I have an Instant Pot. Um, the Instant Pot I can say I almost never use. Um, it's out in the garage right now, mostly to bring to, um, cooking demos when other chefs need it. <laughs> and then um, I do have an air fryer that I use actually not every, 
every week, but pretty regularly. I love it for um, chopping up tofu and tossing it in there with some seasonings and then having some cubed up tofu ready to go to add the salads and different things. I also love it for um, cooking potatoes. I think it cooks potatoes amazing. Um, same thing, diced up, chopped herbs, potatoes. I love using it for that. So I do actually appreciate the air fryer more than I thought I would. Um, I bought it because I needed to... Um, test my burger recipes in the air fryer to make sure that they would work in the air fryer. And then I didn't really think I would ever use it again, but I do. I, that one stays in the house. That one stays out and uh, accessible so that I can use it uh, pretty frequently. But the, my, I think my favorite kitchen tool is my, my immersion blender that I talked about earlier and my um, just having a, a decent knife. I have two that are my favorite. I don't spend money on them. Um, I think this one, was probably less, this one was less than 50 bucks. It's just a regular old chef's knife. And then this one, it's a Kios, uh, Kyocera um, ceramic knife. The only reason I have this, because I'm a klutz and I know I will break things. It doesn't travel, it doesn't leave my kitchen. I keep it in the original package. Is because I uh, fine herbs like uh, cilantro, basil, things like that. Uh, this has such a fine, sharp edge to it that it doesn't damage the leaves when I use it. So those are probably my two most favorite. I have a mandolin, don't ever use it. I bought myself a, a meat slicer so that I can make my home, homemade seitan, um, like lunch meats and stuff, but I haven't used that yet. So I like to buy them, but I don't actually always use them. <laughs> wow, well that sounds like maybe it'd be a good uh, feature for the magazine where you review item, uh, kitchen yeah, items that I barely great. use. How big is a meat slicer? Are you talking like the kind with the deli where you actually go like this? Yeah, like one of those, but I bought a, a mini home version one. It's about it's about this big. The uh, the wheel, the cutting wheel is about this big, and you just put it on there and move it back and forth like a saw, and it'll slice everything nice and tiny. You know what that would be good for is making jicama tortillas. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I got it at Harbor Freight Tools of all places. It was fairly inexpensive. That's what I used my uh, my uh, um, stimulus my stimulus money for. That was my treat. Me and my husband each bought ourselves a treat to stimulate the economy when we got our stimulus checks. And that's what I got with mine. All right, nothing beats a good big salad though, right? I know it's so cliche that vegans only eat salads, blah, 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 blah. I love salad, but only if they don't suck. They have to have a lot of stuff in them, right? They have to have, I call them treasure hunt salads, like nuts and fruit and stuff. And because we already have so much stuff in this tuna salad, we don't have to add a whole lot more. So I'm going to put two nice big scoops of that right here on top. Two scoops, like Raisin Bran. Yeah. On top of these nice greens. These greens, it's a mixed baby greens, some romaine, some chopped up bok choy from the farm. And I'm going to add in some of these baby tomatoes. These are baby heirloom tomatoes. Look how pretty they are, all the different colors. Yeah, mm -hmm. it almost looks like a little watermelon. But I got some nice baby heirloom tomatoes. I'm going to slice those in half, add those to the salad. My favorite tomatoes right now are yellow grape tomatoes. They're so sweet. They're like candy. You pop them right I can snack on them all day long. But, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I, when people ask to be on the show, I just give them the first date available. If they're available, I don't really, you know, try to plan doctor, chef, whatever. And tomorrow I have the food editor of another magazine on. Isn't that weird? What are the chances? What did you say? So that's such a coincidence. Yeah, it's it's a it's an it's a digital magazine called Veg World, but Kathy Catan Grazini is on. I'm like, wow, too, I didn't really even realize you were the food editor. That's very cool. It's fairly new. Um, I this is my second year, so it's it's not been a, a real long time since I've had the position, but it is very fun, and I've met a lot of amazing people, and I've been inspired by a lot of amazing uh, food makers and chefs doing some really incredible work out there. Um, right now, especially. Uh, did you know that compared to traditional restaurants, the rate, there have been more vegan restaurants that have opened and stayed open during the pandemic than a lot of traditional restaurants, which have actually, a lot of them have closed completely. 
So that goes to show you, number one, people are caring about the environment and their health more, but also that, that you know, the plant-based world, the vegan world is a loyal bunch. They want to support other small uh, companies, other uh, vegan companies uh, with their consumer dollars. So I thought that was a fun fact that uh, more vegan restaurants have opened and stayed open during the pandemic than traditional um, restaurants that serve animal products. So I thought that was fun. Let's throw some more of that beautiful avocado in this salad. I was watching something that you were doing the other day and uh, it, it resonated greatly with me um, about uh, if you just eat all vegetables and you're just making big salads and you're just putting big bowls of vegetables up there, you don't have to worry about counting calories or, or measuring everything because everything's good. That's right. I mean, and even it doesn't have to be just vegetables, fruit, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. I call it eating to the left of the red line. You really don't have to monitor what you eat when you eat whole foods. That's the idea. Yeah, that was great because I um, have a little bit of a problem with I take things a little bit to the next level. So I've been journaling all my eating. Uh, and I mean, I go crazy with it. Like I'll break things down and go, you know, with the BMRs and seeing how many calories are in what and, and how many calories I, I burn every day and where should I be and what should, you know, just to get a, you know, a bigger picture of my health and what's going on since I found out uh, about the arthritis and I found out about some other stuff that I'm dealing with. I have some adrenal um, issues, so that's fun. Um, so I'm paying attention to the food a lot more, so I'm journaling, but I find that I do get very... I don't know. I don't know the right word for it. To, I like write so many notes and I take so many and I do so many math problems just to figure out what's going on. So when you said that, I was like, I like that. I like that. You don't have to think about it. You just eat it because you know it's all good for you. Yep. So I like that way of thinking. Time. Let's slice up a little bit more onion to put on here because you never have too much onion. Have you guys ever had Mau have you ever had Maui onion? Yeah, and they're delicious. Oh. When Maui eat onions were in season, I was eating onion sandwiches like every day. Oh, this is a pretty salad. Got all the fun stuff in it. Yeah, you have such beautiful plating techniques. Oh well, thanks. Normally I just make big messes in here. I'm known as the uh, the whirling dervish in the kitchen. I just run around making messes. All do right. Have, do you have time to have any fun or do anything like watch a Netflix show or things like that? Yeah, I just started watching Lovecraft Country. I love it. Um, I never heard it. Of, yeah. I haven't heard of that one. What show? What channel is it on? It's on HBO. It's a. It's not really. I want to say that it's based on a book, but it's not. But it is. It's. Uh, the book is a big part of it, but it's, they like kind of fall into the book, kind of. They're in real world, but the book is happening in real life, kind of. I don't know. It, it's hard to explain, but it's really good. It's kind of like sci-fi adventure, uh, but it's set in the Jim Crow South, which also gives a bit of perspective um, to what was happening in that time in the world, which is also very important right now because of all the things that are going on in our world. So it's very interesting. It's very good. It's very, very good. Okay, let's look at this beautiful salad. Can you see it? Oh my God. When when you when I saw this, I said, like, are you sure one recipe is gonna take the whole time? And then you met you said you were gonna show different variations. Yeah, but I still don't think I took up all the time. Uh, but I do have uh, some other fun stuff to talk about. Yeah. Are are all your sisters vegan? Uh no, one. One is vegan, one is vegetarian, and one is not. Uh, my mom just recently went pescatarian um, after many, many years. Of, you know, I, I try not to be too pushy with the family because then they just get angry and they don't, they don't want to invite me over anymore. So uh, I just invite them over and I cook for them. And eventually they learn by example. And even my dad, who's, who, who used to not even want to taste any vegan foods, let alone give up animal foods, had his own awakening when he <laughs> had a mommy kitty have about nine babies in his backyard that he adopted. And um, I can't believe he kept all those cats. <laughs> he's got so many cats now. And since he's had the, all the cats, he, he's like, I can't even eat meat anymore. I just think of the cats. And I was like, exactly. 
which is how my husband gave up eating meat too. He was cuddling with the cat and had his own awakening as well. So no, not my whole family. I, you know, interestingly enough, my family, both my husband and I both um, come from a family of hunters and fishers. Um, yeah. So there's that. Wow. <laughs> so there's like a lot of hunting in our family as well. So it's very interesting uh, at Thanksgiving at our dinner table. That's for sure. In fact, I think last year, we, the last two years, we just skipped it. We we're just like, we can't. It's too difficult. <laughs> we'll get together on another day. We don't need to sit at a table with a big old dead bird in, in the middle of it. Those big, beautiful birds. Have you ever seen a wild turkey in the wild? I haven't. The, the, some of the most magnificent creatures. We were doing a road trip um, in Colorado, and there was like a whole flock of, of wild turkeys on the side of the road. And I just stopped and stared at them for probably an hour because they were just so magnificent looking and so big and so... Like, I don't even know how they fly. They're so huge, but they were, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful bird. I can't imagine ever again, putting that on my plate when there's so many other fun things you can eat. I could just keep adding things to the salad. I just added some more uh, sunflower seeds to it because it looked like it needed a little sprinkle of something. Just out of curiosity, the, the one sister that is vegan, is she also the one that got the tattoo? Yes. Yes, I knew it. I knew it. See, that's the, that's the she good system. She also lives in Portland, so she has access to, like, every amazing vegan restaurant in the world up there. I got to get up and visit her as soon as this whole pandemic thing gets a little bit more under control so I can go eat some good food with my sissy. Well, absolutely. Well, you've made me very hungry today. Thank you. So, and, and what I love about your recipe was well, one, the simplicity, but that you were able to make one recipe and then make so many different things out of it. And that's what people need to think about. You don't need, even though you have thousands of recipes, you don't need thousands of recipes. You just need like a few really good ones. That's very, very, very true. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's so great catching up with you. Thank you enjoy yeah and thank all of you for watching another episode of chef aj live if you like cooking demos and who doesn't please come back tomorrow with another wonderful editor of a magazine veg world kathy Catan. i hope i'm saying her name right grazini is going to be cooking up a storm and if you want to where would you like people to follow you instagram uh, go to your website just the food that's great just the food i've got lots of recipes there or instagram is joni marie newman absolutely great thanks so much joni Bye. Take care, everyone.